I need that. Hello? Okay. Hello, my name is Anna Lewis. I'm the president of, high, of the High School Student Council. On behalf of the high school students, we want to thank Ms. Pettigrasso and the Board of Education for giving us the opportunity again this year to host the Meet the Candidates Night. The Lansing High School SEO is, advi is advised by Tina Mallinson and is made up of 17 high school students. This year's activities included Moore's Tree Farm Hunt, a winter whiteout dance, candy for a cure, and the holiday food drive. We co-hosted the annual Brawl for the Ball at Trumansburg this year, and we are planning our Cupcakes for a Cure fundraiser in June, in which all donations will be given to a local charity. Our plan is to donate two leadership scholarships for a total of $500 this year to the class of 2019, along with a significant purchase of outdoor furniture for the new courtyard at the high school. Hi, my name is Claire Dowell, and I'm the vice president of the student council. Um, this year we have four candidates running for three positions. Good luck to you all. They are Kristen Hopkins, Linda Pasto, Susan Tabrizi, and Aaron Thompson. I'd like to take this time for each candidate to introduce themselves, oh, to introduce and to briefly tell them, tell them, tell us about them. Want me to start? Sure. Okay. I'm Linda Pasto. I'm a 34-year resident of Lansing. I have four children that have gone through the school district who've done incredibly well with the education that they received here. I am a retired faculty member from TC3, 32 years of teaching nursing uh, in a classroom, clinical, and online format. Um, I have done a number of things in uh, Lansing schools over the years. I was a PTSO president, PTSO secretary. I was on the site-based decision-making team, was actually on the team that wrote the original plan for the school district and then served on the middle school, the high school, and the district team. Um, and currently um, I'm involved in PTSO and the, have done sports boosters, El Tapa, um, you name it. I think I've, I've hit it all over, over the 34 years we've been here. I also need to, because I forgot to write it in my biography, and I, my granddaughter will never forgive me. Um, I am an, a very active parent of a 10-year-old who's in fourth grade. My husband and I are raising our granddaughter, which means at 65 I'm back into parenting again. So I've been going to meetings and uh, sitting on those little chairs and uh, learning all over again what it's like to be a parent. It's been, actually been an incredible and really fun. So that's a little bit about me. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm battling a cold, so just bear with me. Um, so, my, let's see, is my mic on? There we go. Uh, I think my light's on. Okay. Um, so, my name's Kristen Hopkins. Um, I am a 12-year taxpaying resident here in Lansing, um, but my family is fourth-generation um, Lansingites, uh, going back to my grandmother, Jean Bishop, who was one of the first students to ever attend um, the Lansing schools when the middle school was the K through 12 um, building at that time back in the early 1930s. Um, I currently have three children. They are in sixth grade, they are in second grade, and one is 18 months old. Um, and sort of similar to Linda, our 18 month old is actually my niece. Um, we had a very um, uneventful, or I shouldn't say uneventful, but a very unexpected fall this year. We're, we're now raising my niece as my sister-in-law passed away, so that has given me a, a very different lens for which I've been navigating through the school system this year. Um, for the past four years, I have served as president of our PTSO, which I'm very proud of. Um, in addition to that tenure there, I've been on the PTSO board for six years. Um, I'm a member of the Lansing Tech Boosters, formerly known as the CDC. I support El Tapa with various volunteer opportunities. I've been a member of um, the RC Buckley shared decision making team and also have recently been on the inclusion task force um, working with Colleen and the group of parents on there. Um, part of my role with PTSO that I'm really proud of is the fact that um, we really re-envisioned what that organization meant to the district, how we wanted that organization to interact among the district. Um, and a big part of that was building partnerships across our administration and our leadership because as the education 
landscape has changed, the role of teachers have changed, the role of parents have changed in terms of what everyone's bandwidth is and what everyone can do. And so I'm really proud of the fact that through that leadership role, we've been able to work with um, our principals and everyone to help augment and support the needs that are currently in the district versus having, say, our own agenda and wanting to do our own things. We've really looked at how do we come together as a whole, how do we support our entire district versus trying to have competing priorities. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> it's causing a thing, that's for sure. <laughs> so, hi, everybody. Thank you. Oh. Dollar nothing? Okay. Thank you. I think off would be better. Yeah, if that's okay. I'll, uh. So, hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Susan Tabrizi. Um, I currently sit on the Board of Education. I've been a member of the board now for three years. I'm a Lansing resident. My kids are in eighth grade and fourth, uh, fourth grade, soon to be middle schooler, soon to be high schooler. <laughs> Take a moment with that. Um, I've been really honored and privileged to serve as a member of the school board and I'm here because I want to continue that service. During my time on the board we've had lots of important decisions to make. Everything from helping to craft a budget that maintains the excellence that we have in academics as well as co-curricular opportunities for all of our students and making sure that, that those opportunities are broad um, across a diverse set of students um, but also making sure that we have the financial planning in place to minimize the burden on taxpayers. Uh, we have to keep that balance and I'm very proud of the work that the board has done um, along with our administrators. As you know, because you live in the district, you've seen lots of changes in the district in terms of both our physical infrastructure as well as some of the programming that we have here. Um, one of the biggest and most dear to my heart is the focus that we have been putting on social emotional learning, um, infusing that throughout the curriculum, as well as the focus that we have on mental health and wellness. Um, we know that this is critical for all of us, for our students, for our staff, for our teachers, and I'm very proud to say that the district is really investing in that well-being. Um, I'd like to be on the board yet again because I think that there is more work that can be done. Um, in the community, I volunteer with the Lansing Food Pantry. Um, I'm involved with the Food Bank of the Southern Tier, and um, I'm very focused on the idea of making sure that our students have the foundations that they need to be able to take advantage of the opportunities that we are hoping to provide for them here in Lansing. So um, going forward, working on nutrition and um, healthy food and its availability and addressing issues of hunger in our community are part of my priority. Thank you. I'm Aaron Thompson. I have problems with my mic a lot. So I'll just speak up. So I'm also on, I have been on the board for three years. Uh, my history of Lansing is my grandmother went to Lansing and taught at Lansing and my mom went to Lansing and I've got two kids, one in fifth grade and one in eighth grade that are in Lansing. Um, I'm, my full-time job is a deputy sheriff. I've been an officer for 20 years. I've been with Tompkins County for just over 18 years. Um, part, of, part of wanting to work for Tompkins County is, is being part of the community. And part of being on the, of the Lansing Town Board is being on the, the smaller community that, that raised me and is raising my kids. Um, two aspects of the, of the board that I'm on, I'm on the safety committee, I'm on the facilities committee, which kind of go hand in hand when it, when, with safety is, um, as, as you see in the news, there are, there are some situations that come up and we, the, the board, I think, does, and the school district does a good job on how to um, prevent and detect uh, any, any situation that could come up, whether it's, it's um, people passing school buses or it could be something where it might come down to a, a lockdown situation that we have to keep the students safe. Um, that goes with the facilities committee as well as how to plan and organize and and add on to the to the campus to make it fit best for the safety and the, and the student flow um, the 
I'd, I'd like to continue to be on the board because of because of the concerns of of the the town is growing and the school district has has some we've we've over overcome the the, the power plant and 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 I guess the detriment to the school of, of that closing and losing the value. Um, the next the next step that's in the horizon is the um, 82 unit housing that's going to come in and the uncertainty of, of the student growth, how many students may come in, how what we what's best to um, design and, and possibly add teachers or add on classrooms as that student pot body may fluctuate as department populations may fluctuate how, what's best to what's the most efficient efficient way to do that for the taxpayer um, as well as getting, getting the best education for the for the student okay that sums up <coughs> yeah okay hi my name is Mason and I'm the co-treasurer of student council um, student council has prepared four questions for tonight's program each candidate will have two minutes to answer each each question, and there will be a timer to tell you when you are done. <laughs> okay. Uh <-huh>. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start with you, candidate one. What is the more, most important aspect of our school district to you? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say I love Lansing. We, we have chosen to stay here and retire here even before our granddaughter came into the picture. Uh, it's, it's just a vibrant community. Um, what the thing that I feel that, uh, can you repeat the question one more time? So I'm just, because I had a, an idea in my head and then I'm. Okay. It is, what is the most important aspect of our school district to you? Okay. So I would say the students. The students are the critical piece. And I think that um, the students are becoming increasingly diverse. We saw the numbers that Kate uh, mentioned. It's something that. Uh, is incredibly important to me to make sure that we continue to address that diversity, whether it's socioeconomic, whether it's uh, racial diversity, sexual orientation, whatever the diversity is, it's very important that we continue to make sure that we're addressing those issues and that we listen to our students. It's very important that we hear student voices. So I think we as adults can make lots of decisions about what we think is best for kids. But a really good school is a school that always has the students first. And I think that's, that's what's really important. And in that light, especially in the um, increasing um, free lunch rate, uh, one of the things that, that I have felt very important about in meeting the socio-emotional uh, needs of students is I started two years ago a summer campership program because I feel that every kid should be excited about summer. Everything, every kid should have something to look forward to. And it was just an idea. I went to PTSO. They said, we'll be your structure. We'll let you go out and use us to ask money. So I'd never done that before. I'd never really asked for money. It's always you know, not been part of my role. So I started looking for money. I wrote two grants, which were both successful, one of them from Kathleen Snyder and her family. So we now have the Kevin Snyder Bobcat Summer Campership Program. And we have $9,500 that we've gotten grants for that we'll send 45 kids to camp this summer because I think that we need to think about our kids year-round. We can't, can't just think about them during the school year. So, <laughs> well, that's not a hook, but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll work. Do we get a 10-second, like, warning? <laughs> yeah, give us, like, the you wrap get, up you get two. <laughs> you get to sneak two more words in. That's yes. about it. <laughs> Same question? Yep. Okay. Um, so I agree with a lot of what Linda said in terms about students, but I, I would take it a little bit broader and say that the most important aspect, really, of our district is, is that sense of belonging, right? As we look at, um, from the board perspective, ensuring that we have the resources and tools in place to support the whole student, being able to do that is really being able to create that sense of belonging so that regardless of where you come from, what your experiences are, what your socioeconomic status is, you feel like you have value, you f students feel like they're important, our teachers feel like they are valued, that they're doing good work. And so by doing that, we really need to operate harmoniously amongst our community. That is engagement with our parents. That's engagement with community partnerships, whether it's the rec center, whether it's the Y, whether it's the town. But then also internally, right? Like we need to be able to build that sense of community 
amongst ourselves, right? So it's, it's extending across your little circle of friends. It's faculty interacting with each other in different buildings because you have that shared environment where everyone's constantly learning. And the more that we can be harmonious, ensure that we have programs, resources, tools, our students are going to feel empowered, they're going to excel, and it gives them an opportunity to start to, to own their academic experience. At the same time, it allows them to step out of the comfort zone, take a class that may, they may not want to take. It allows teachers to explore with how they run their classroom, whether it's resources, whether it's you know, looking at modular furniture, taking you know, things, less paper, using Google Classroom. Like, all of that is what can be accomplished when we really invest in creating that sense of belonging for everyone. I know as a parent, is that my, is that my wrap up cue? <laughs> <laughs> so am I done? Or do I have 10 no, seconds? Ten seconds. No, okay. So I mean like, like as a parent, right, like you can have, there's challenging conversations that need to happen sometimes. And being able to feel like I belong as a parent, as well as the board, is only going to make that much more effective. <laughs> so the best things about Lansing. Um, I think one of the best things here in Lansing is that um, we are focused on helping students be who they are and become who they can be. And I think that starting with that, allowing people to be who they are is really important. It provides a foundation for growth. Um, also providing opportunity for students to develop into who they can be, whether that's through their academic work, through their co-curricular <coughs> work, through their social work, through their process of self-discovery. Having the supportive environment that is located at the school really provides that essential foundation um, that we all need. And I know that um, as a parent and as an educator, I, t I teach college students, I know how important it is um, for students to really feel that. And, and so I echo what, what Linda and, and Kristen say. Um, but I really think that what we're talking about is opportunity. Um, and not just opportunity on paper and opportunity in process, but opportunity plus the ability to actually realize that opportunity and for that opportunity to make that opportunity real. That doesn't happen by accident. That doesn't happen by hoping. That happens through purposeful planning. That happens because we intend it. Everything from making sure our kids have food in their belly so they can think in their classroom to making sure that they understand that they have support when times get tough and putting them through the paces of pushing them to develop academically. Thank you. I get to go last. So yeah. I, <laughs> I would agree, with, I would agree with, with the three answers, but I think what, what makes the kids feel welcome and, and that they can grow and, and thrive and, and be what they, be, they can be and feel safe is the faculty and the staff. And I think that's huge that, that they're all committed. The, 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 the superintendent is committed to what's the best programs that are out there Kate, the, the business administrator, is how can, we, how can we budget this for the taxpayer? And the principals and the, and the counselors and the teachers are committed to have the kids feel comfortable enough to, to push themselves and to grow and to be who they are and, and to go beyond their limits. Um, that goes back, to, it goes to the coaches, it goes to the Lansing Rec Department when they start out in, in four years old playing ball, the, the town is, is united around the school and around Rec to to have the, the students be, be the best that they can be. And it takes, it takes the staff, it takes the whole, it takes the whole administration to, to want that. And they all, they all want it, and they all push it, and they all do their extra time to do it. And, it, and, and as a board and a superintendent of business, we, we get along. We all have the same goal and objectives in mind and different, maybe different ways of getting to it. But we all work together to do what's best for the school. And, and I think that's the best. That's the greatest thing about Lansing. Thank you. My name is Bridget, and I'm the Secretary of Student Council. In what ways, we're starting with candidate two this time, in what ways could we get more participation 
and unity between our school district and community members. <coughs> Can you repeat that one more time? Mm -hmm. In what ways could we get more participation in unity between our school district and community members? That's an, that is an excellent question. And, you know, it's one that um, in PTSO, it's a question that we've been asking for the last four years as well, right? And in part, part of that really is, is volunteerism, right? Like we, we want to have participation between the district and the community. And the first line of entry to be able to do that is for folks to volunteer and get involved, right? Because once you engage in the school district, you recognize the value, the talent, the, you, f you become inspired to see what students are doing, what faculty is doing, to see those collaborations. And so I think right now we have, you know, everyone is caught up in the, the, the craziness of daily life and we're overscheduled, we're overwhelmed, right? And so we don't make that commitment to, pri not to prioritize, but to really take a firm look or a closer look is what is most important? Like what is, where am I gonna feel self-fulfilled? How am I going to be a better role model for my student, for my child? And part of that becomes with volunteering, making that time to give back, whether that is an hour in the entire school year, whether that's an hour in the week. The quantity of time doesn't matter. But being able to prioritize that time um, is rewarding, right? And so in, in order to do that, members in the community who are not yet engaged need to know that they haven't, there's an open book. You can come and participate. There are multiple ways to get involved um, and to participate. Um, and so I think, you know, by, by having those opportunities, it's, it, build, it automatically builds the unity because you have that engagement. You see what's happening firsthand. Thank you. Hi, thanks. So I think that one of the things that we need to do as a community is to make sure that we are valuing the contribution that community members make in their unique way. Not everyone has the time or interest to do the bake sale, the sport, the academic work, the right, whatever it may be, pick, pick it. Um, some people excel in one area and others excel in another area. And I think it's really important if we want to build community to meet people where they are and to invite them in for their unique contributions and to make sure that we are saying to people what you bring to our community matters. Just as we do for our students, we do that for our families and for our, our, our um, uh, parents as well. A variety of ways to participate. That also means that we have to have a variety of ways to communicate with families. Um, we have now a great website. We have email communication. Um, we also try to have small group meetings. We have presentations where people can show up face to face and actually get to know each other and hear each other and sometimes disagree but realize that what you're doing is disagreeing with your neighbors who, um, to steal your, your, your words, Erin, all have the same best interest of our community at heart. It's only through that actual communication and valuing of different contributions that we build a real community, an organic community that has diverse voices, some disagreements, but a path and a goal that we're all headed toward. Thank you. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there now for people to see it. There's, there's the websites, there's Twitter, there's different ways that the school reaches out to the community. There's, the, there's emails. There's even things like the morning milers where you can go in and, and run in the mornings. It's not really school affiliated, but it's on campus. Um, Lansing Star posts things every now and again. There's, there's an outreach out there. It's, it's a whole thing where people aren't volunteering. They're, they're not really getting involved just in general in, in anything. And it takes us as a, as a community member, as a family, as a friend, or whatever, if there's, if there's a ball game or if there's a play or whatever, invite your brothers, invite 
your, your cousins, your uncles, or friends, neighbors, just, just to come. And we have to get out there and do it individually because the social media, there is a lot out there. It just takes the time for people to do it. It takes us to say, hey, come along and see what this is all about. Come, come to a golf game. Come to, come to something and reach out and, and do it organically and have it just, it's a great town. Just, just come, to a, come to a game and, and spread the word that way. And as if you can get two or three people to come, they'll see it. They'll, the, Lansing's a great town and people will, they know, but sometimes you take it. It's take it for granted and just ask, ask your classmates to come out. And the five of you coming to do this is, is amazing. <laughs> and and have, have encourage other people to join student council to come to things like this and, and just get involved and just do the face-to-face -face communication is, is huge. It's harder to say no to someone's face than it is over a text. <laughs> no. Okay, sometimes it's hard to go first and sometimes <laughs> it's hard to go last. <laughs> Um, so a few of the things I think everybody has said has made some really good points. Uh, one of the things I think we need to think about in light of, of our economic uh, need to make sure that we are able to keep our budget where it needs to be is that we need to start collaborating more with our community. And I think one of the things that has been very apparent to me, again, is talking about the campership and also Susan and I have been collaborating. Susan's really been the spearhead for a summer um, backpack program. And our community has been incredibly generous, but we honestly could not be doing either the summer campership or the summer backpack program without <coughs> significant help from the community. And I think that it's something that we need to, as a school, reach out because by reaching out and pulling the community in, there are lots of people out there that want to do things. They don't really know how to do it. And as Aaron was saying, invite them in, and sometimes that inviting them in is say, can you help us financially with this idea that we had? Um, Lori Whiteman had a need this year for fresh produce for our, our weekend backpack kids. So we just sat down and talked about it, and all of a sudden, money came in, and we were <coughs> able to get it started, and it, it pulled those people in that felt, felt like they were able to make a difference. People want to make a difference, we need to get, sometimes give them the avenue. And it also takes the burden off the school. You know, there, there are things out there that need to happen, but we can't fund it all. And I think that's a way to really work as a whole community, the, the Lansing community. Um, another idea, we've had some great programs, and I think sometimes if we take our pro programs away from school, that gives us a safe place sometimes for people to do it. And one of my favorite things was I was asked to volunteer in the fifth grade health class, and I loved it. So ask people to come in, too. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Alex. I'm a co-treasurer of the Student Council. So starting with candidate three, the question is, what role does mental health play on school safety? Mental health is fundamental to school safety. Absolutely. Um, mental health is fundamental period, right? Every single one of us needs to guard our mental health, to develop our mental health, to reach out to others in order to bolster our mental health, and to rely on others when our mental health may be under pressure. Um, as you heard in my opening statement, mental health is a, is a significant issue. Um, for me, I see it with my students at college, I see it with our students here, our faculty, our staff, we're all human beings. Um, when it comes to safety in particular, um, I think that mental health is environment. Mental health is community. Mental health is about the sense of belonging um, that Kristen mentioned. Um, and I think it's I'm grateful to say that in our society, we are starting to transition away from the idea that your mental health is your problem, and it's not a community issue. It is, in fact, a community issue. And I'm grateful for the investment that the school has put towards mental health, and I look forward to continuing to deepen that. I think mental health is huge. As a, as a deputy for 18 years, it's, it's not just the safety of school. It's, 
it, mental health is huge and, and it's inconsistent and un, unpredict, unpredictable and the schools have a huge burden with minimal staff and to, and to keep track and to help four or five hundred kids in a building, three, four hundred kids in each building and to keep track and to see who really needs help, who needs help beyond the school walls and to get the families involved with, with a child that needs help beyond a student, a, a school. I think the school is a great place to detect it. I think teachers and all staff can say, this kid needs help today. This kid is going to need help throughout his, his tenure at Lansing. And they can, sometimes they can help just a meeting a month or a week. And sometimes that, the staff has to say to the family, you really need to get involved because this kid needs help. And that, it's not just safety of, of what might come in as, a, as a, the awful, like a school killing, but as a just safety of, of running down the halls or, run, or throwing chairs or breaking glass or, or safety for the, own, the only student for, their, for themselves. Um, it, it, it's a great, like I said, it's a great little area pocket where you can see the students, you can see the mental health, and you can, the teachers and staff see them day by day, and they can pick out when a kid is, is, needs help or if their medication isn't balanced or if they haven't taken it. it, it it's a great window to start the mental health, but it, it, takes more, it takes more than the school to, I don't know, fix, I don't think, fix isn't the right word, but to, to manage it, to manage mental health. And there's some that may have a, a major stress in their life that they just need a month or so to kind of cope and, and get on and, and, and talk over. And then there's kids that, that and staff that have it it's a lifelong battle, and it's it's one of those things you have to balance the resources to the to the student population. So one of the first things I want to say is I really applaud the school because there have been some really good programs and dialogue this year. I think for the first time it is safe to talk about it, and um, that it's safe to learn about it. Um, not that. It was never done in the 34, 33 years that my kids have been here, or 30, yeah, 34 years. Um, but I think that it's, it's becoming, we are aware that it's an issue um, that we need to address, that we can't just assume that the teachers can do everything and that we need help. Um, the Ithaca Journal uh, this Saturday had the front page article on how safe are your schools. And the incident of violence, bullying, sexual offense, and weapon possessions has gone up 31% since 2012-13, according to the State Ed Department. Now, some of that has to do with how it's being reported, but it certainly is very apparent that it's, that it's a need that we need to continue to address. And by talking about it, it destigmatizes it. Um, it's, it's, it allows kids to, to find a safe place to come and staff, because certainly it's not just a student issue. It certainly is a staff. It's an employee issue. It's a community issue. And again, going back to community, there are community resources out there, too, that we also need to be able to tap into, because the school shouldn't have to do it all. We have, in Tompkins County, we're incredibly blessed as a member of the healthcare field to know the, the resources that we have in this community. So. We also, as a school district, can't do it all. We need to be able to reach out and tap into those resources that we have. And I think most importantly, listen to, listen to everyone, not just the students, but listen to voices. It's very important to listen and take people seriously when they're talking. I think I'm not going to like that sound from now on. <laughs> you have dreams about it. I will. It'll be in my, in my nightmare. So, I mean, I, I agree with what everyone has said in terms of, you know, mental health is, is part of the foundation to having a safe school, right? And so mental health is everything from being able to effectively manage your stress to ensuring that you're taking your medication, that a child has food in their stomachs, that they're, you know, not acting outward because, um, you know, they're hungry. Um, but, but part of that is it's the, it's the culture and it's the environment in which we, we continue to talk about mental health. I mean, we have put forth, you know, all of, you know, additional resources. We now have a full FTE in, in every building um, to help from that in terms of managing through the day. But it's programs like PBIS in the middle school, the Be the One campaign, helping students to identify, you know, a trusted adult. 
um, having those conversations in class, having things like um, in the high school we have the, the parent conversations in the, with the principal and you know the dean of students and, and being able to look at mental health as, as a community at, amongst ourselves, you know, one-to-one, -one, and helping students come up with the strategies and the tools so that they can start to self-identify when they need to turn to someone, whether it's a peer, whether it's an adult, so that they can effectively manage through that so that we don't get to a point where school has become unsafe because we haven't taught them and coached them and mentored them along the way to know how to manage that. I mean, suicide rates for 13 to 18 year old kids are the highest that they've ever been. You know, a lot of that comes from recognizing the influences of social media and, and parents being engaged and having those conversations at home in terms of, you know, the utiliza utilization of technology and what are you doing, you know, on that. And so, you know, as we look at mental health, we have to look at the, the tools that we're bringing to our students and into our school. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. Thank you. So for our last question, you'll have three minutes to answer. Uh, and we'll start with candidate four. Where do you see areas of growth, and how would you go about improving them? I think mental health is one of the areas of growth that, that continuously expands. And, and, and like Linda said, back when I was in school, when she was in school, and her kids in school, the amount of counseling and social programs and so social networks now are I don't know, without, uh, 10 times without looking into it, <laughs> don't hold me to that, but 10 times what they used to be. There is, there is a growth with that. There are different ways of, of um, helping kids through that. Um, the growth with, within the campus to keep it safe and to keep the flow and what, how to um, manage the influx of the students, which is great that Vancey wants to grow and people want to move here, but then with that is how do we most cost most efficiently, cost effectively, um, grow the campus and add classrooms and add staff and faculty as needed for that. Um, I think one of the things, I don't know if it would fall into this, this topic or not, but a lot of the things that's, that I've seen come up is um, the uh, restorative justice is one thing that the, the school, the, the state and the, the country is trying to get into this restorative justice growth where it's not it's a step towards discipline, but it's not suspending kids. It's not getting out of the, the kids out of the class. And that seems to be a growing trend. But my concern with that is that, yes, kids aren't being suspended, but there's a lot of studies that show grade levels and, or grade te test scores are also going down because of the disruptive kids going back to the class where they may not see were they disciplined, were they punished, or, or whatever, spoken to even for the behavior. And that's, that's a growth that's, that's expanding that, that I want to be involved in. I want to watch and I want to see how, make sure that's done, not as a knee-jerk reaction, but applied appropriately and safely and for the best of the student and for the student body. I don't know. You still have one minute. Yeah. <laughs> so how are you? That's as long as time. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I'm not long-winded. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Erin. So I, I'm not going to take your minute. That's okay. That's okay. Um, one of the areas that I see, and we talked about it statistically, is certainly diversity is an increased is increasing. And however you define diversity, it's something that I personally uh, lived with with my girls. My youngest daughter's from India. My next oldest daughter is from Korea. And I will tell you, they were bullied in school, and we had to deal with that. In fact, we had to pull our youngest daughter out of her last year of high school and send her to TC3 because it was not pretty here. Um, and I say that. I'm still incredibly proud of the education that they had, and I love Lansing, and I'm still, my granddaughter's still here. She's half Korean. She fits that multiracial category now. Um, but I think we have to always be vigilant and, and think about um, are we addressing the fact that our school district looks different than it did. You know, when my oldest son, who's 40 now, graduated, there were, I could count on one hand, there were three kids that weren't white in his class. And in my granddaughter's class, there's probably 15. And are we, are we you know, the, that, real, that growth piece 
um, whether it is an economic, socioeconomic or racial or whatever, is is something that is not going to change. It's, it's going to continue to be a piece of who we are as Lansing. Uh, we talked about mental health, and I think that we've recognized that mental health is a huge piece that, is, um, that we need to address. And uh, as technology changes, we need to be aware of um, how that's playing out in the school and how we address it. We need to make sure that we're providing staff development because we can't just expect teachers who were educated 10 or 15 years ago to have everything in their toolbox that we thought they needed 15 years ago because the school doesn't look like it did 15 years ago. And we also need continually, continually need to reach out to the community for support and also educate the community. So all the um, development programs that we offer for staff, we also need to try to educate the community as well because they need to be aware of um, all the things that are going on. And I think what the last piece that I've been reading more and more about is that a lot of our college students, and I certainly have taught college, at the college level for many years, um, we need to be aware of teaching them life skills to be adults. That our, our current students, and I, Susan's shaking her head, I can tell you my most recent students were really not adults when they came to college and they really missed out on a lot of things that we used to teach. We used to teach home and careers and a lot of life skills that they need to be successful and we've lost that piece in, in our educational process. I took the whole three minutes. <laughs> Don't I get Aaron's minute now? <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat the question real quick? Yeah, of course. So where do you see areas of growth and how would you go about improving them? So when, when I think of growth, I actually think about it in, in a couple of different lanes. One of them is, is the literal term, right, which is growth in terms of our population. So we constantly have to be proactive in looking at how our enrollment is going to grow, the impact that that has on class size, teaching resources, our staffing, um, you know, the whole capital infrastructure of that. But at the same time, in, in order to, to sustain that growth, we also have educational innovation, right? And so the impact of that is how we teach students is changing, right? That is evolving. And we need to be able to continue to allow our teachers to have, have the training, have the, the leeway to look at how they structure their classroom. Um, whether it's things like modular seating, flipped classroom, project-based learning, immersion learning, you know, they, we need to be able to grow their toolbox, not just in terms of the, their, their resources and training, but the access to those types of learning standards so that they can be the most effective in the classroom, so that students can find a way that resonates with them to be able to learn, to tap into their you know, academic abilities, their interests. Um, but at the same time, while we're doing all of that, we have to grow, you know, our mental health resources to ensure that they are supported, you know, our students are supported along the way, that our teachers feel confident um, that they have the skills in their toolbox to, to nurture our students. Um, but in, in all of that comes together um, to, you know, from a board's perspective to making sure that as we look at um, our responsibility to the taxpayers, that decisions are being made, that money is moving between those buckets, that instructional bucket, that administrative bucket appropriately, so that our, our district can have the most flexibility to be able to respond to the growth in the multiple areas that we're going to be seeing in the next five to ten years from now, right? Because being a, in higher education, you know, one of the questions that we're constantly asked is, are we expecting too much of incoming freshmen, right? And so that conversation is happening in higher ed, but at the same time that ha is happening here in secondary education. And so as higher education requirements are changing, we have to be able to change and adapt to that as well to ensure that we are consistently meeting students where they need to be and that they're going to be prepared for the next challenge without feeling like they have to do everything, right? Like, you, we have to be able to instill in you guys, the students, that you can say no to things. You don't need to have a growing schedule that gives you five hours of sleep. And so we do that by looking at our different teaching models, looking at the type of curriculum we offer. And so all of that's going to grow together as we literally grow population-wise. Yes. 
<laughs> Agreed. Right? I, I think, you know, first I, 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 would, I would say, you know, um, we're fortunate to have such a wonderful group of people who want to spend their time helping our community. And I, th I thank you all, all three of you, um, for your dedication to that. Um, in terms of growth, I would say that while we look to the future, while we look to what we add, we need to be mindful of foundation, right? Um, uh, uh, Alex, you asked the question about mental health, and, and um, I truly believe that that is a foundation, not only in addressing students who are struggling with mental health issues, but as a community, all of us growing our awareness and our self-care, um, and learning how to, how to do that, um, infusing that, as I said, across the curriculum. Um, dealing with the real issues of hunger and health in our community. We are very fortunate. We have many people in this community who socioeconomically are extremely well off. That is not the same for all of our friends and our neighbors. And we need to attend <coughs> to that and make sure that as a community we are moving all of us forward. Um, as Kristen mentioned, curricular innovation has got to be at the forefront of what we are not only asking of our teachers, but providing mm -hmm. for our teachers. Um, as a, a college teacher myself, I know that the difference between what I did several <laughs> years ago when I started um, <laughs> and what I do now is, is vast. Um, our teachers are being asked to be nimble and to be innovative, and the only way that they can do that is with support from the district and from the community that says, yes, Attend to the different learning styles in your classroom. <coughs> have the time, have the ability to attend to that smaller number of students in your classroom so that you can do that, so that we can be developing opportunity um, for our kids and really preparing for life and career. Um, I keep using this word opportunity, <coughs> and I think it is very important that we have real opportunity and we have realized opportunity because being able to realize opportunity is really putting it into practice. It's going to move us all forward um, together. Um, that idea of preparation for a changing world. We don't know what that five years, 10 years, 15 year um, change is going to be. But to the extent that we, as a board, <coughs> build infrastructure and institutional practice that allows us to be nimble, to be innovative, and to work consistently and constantly together, I think we win. Thank you. We now would like to open up the floor to questions from the public. <laughs> Chad, <laughs> wait, I'm a surprise. I know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, how important do you think transparency is in the district as far as school board meetings and providing school documents? And if you if you're familiar with the sunshine law, well, how that relates to the sunshine. Yeah, yeah. I think transparency is essential. I mean, we work for the community. Our meetings are public. Our communication, for the most part, is public, except for when we are dealing with uh, issues that are particularized to certain individuals, right, which are necessarily not public. Um, records of our meetings are available. We're being recorded right now. And of course, the um, Freedom of um, Freedom, freedom of Information Act um, and laws in New York State that govern the accessibility of the public to that information are very important. I don't think that there's, um, in my three years on the board, anything that, that, that um, has indicated to me that there's anything but a willingness to be transparent among my colleagues and the administration. I agree too. I think transparency is huge. I think it's very important. Um, and what's I don't know upsetting maybe is 
every board meeting, there's no, the only time there's audience members is when there's students at projects. <laughs> oh. or maybe, maybe, a, a, or maybe a gripe here and there once or twice, but it's for the most part, it's empty seats. Maybe people are watching it online or so. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it's always encouraged. Questions are always encouraging, and and I love it when you come with questions. You really dig in. You find mm -hmm. you find the questions that no one else would ever think of, and and you ask. Them <laughs> and I, I I like it. I it, it holds us accountable. Absolutely. It keeps us on on our toes. But either you do it just to bust our chops, or you really care. Either way, you ask those questions. Maybe it's a little bit of both. And I I encourage more community members to come, and the superintendent and the and the business administrator, and all of our, the board members, all of us feel. If there's questions or concerns or, or maybe different ways of, of doing things, bring them up. Come to a meeting, address the board, and we can't really answer and we can't talk them back, but we can listen and we always encourage people to come and, and voice their concerns and questions or compliments or, or have the transparency back and forth. I, I think it's really important. Well, I think, I mean, it's the law. I mean, it is the law and, it, you know, it's the sunshine law. So. You know, it's something that we have to follow. Um, I think that's bottom line. And certainly there are a few exceptions to when a meeting has to be open, and that has to do with primarily with personnel or, you know, privacy kinds of things. And certainly as someone who's coming from the, the uh, healthcare field, I'm very aware of HIPAA, and it's something that, you know, I've had to live with for, um, not live with, but abide by for many, many years in my career. Um, but I think it's it's critically important that there is that openness. And I, I am a, um online geek, I will tell you, that I do like to watch the meetings online. I don't always, <laughs> I d there are some of us out there that actually do watch, the, you know, watch the meetings. And, and uh, you know, I like to know what's going on and, and can't always, you know, can't often get here to voice anything because of all the other commitments that I've got in the community. But, you know, I think, the videotaping piece is very, very important because it provides a link. And the un unfortunate part is not everybody has access to that technology, and um, so we can't we can't reach everybody. But uh, but to me, it's it's a critical part of being accountable. We are accountable to the community. That's you know that's that's a big piece. We have to we have to be accountable to uh, to the com the community and to the school. So transparency is really important. Transparency builds trust, right? Mm -hmm. And so as a board and as a district, we, we go above and beyond to ensure that there are multiple mechanisms in which the community is, can be informed, whether it's online through recording, it's, it's print in the mailers, there's email, everyone here is accessible, you know, with an email account from a board perspective. Um, and so the more opportunities that the district provides to the community to build those methods of trust, it allows for the board to be able to operate seamlessly so that when there are those moments where executive session is required for a confidential issue, th the community can feel assured that because we have demonstrated this level of transparency and, and you are, we have built your trust, that you can rest assured that those executive sessions are purposeful, that there's a reason, and that you don't have, and although that there's a reason, we do have, you know, the Sunshine Law and the, and the FOIL Act to be able to, you know, counteract that if necessary, but we operate, and you know, functionally and um, effectively that right now I have not seen the board need to be able to, or have those laws impact the board, but the more transparent that we are, the more trust that we are building across our community. And we're doing a really good job of that here in the district. You know you want to ask some more, <laughs> Ted. Come on. <laughs> oh, good. Of course it's okay. One of the things that the five of us were um, passionately discussing back there, I apologize if anyone here, was the role of being environmentally conscious in the school. And I was wondering what each of you think, like how we can improve that, since it's a very big issue for our generation, especially. I'll start out with that, and probably go, probably against the grain on a lot of things. The environmental issue caused part of the cause of the power plant closing, it cost millions in tax dollars. It's costing jobs. So the environment is important. So is energy. 
and so is the school. So I, I think there could be a balance between the environment and between energy and between the cost, but ultimately it costs millions when that power plant has closed, and Kate would have better numbers than how much it costs. And as families are losing jobs, they now have milli they ha now have budgets, so they have to figure out when they don't have jobs. There's talk of the power plant going to natural gas. That's great. That's one step a little bit cleaner than coal. There's still resistance against that. There's a moratorium on natural gas in Lansing that restricts businesses wanting to come to Lansing that cost millions in tax dollars that has to be passed on to the residents. So I think environmental awareness is important. I think steps to go cleaner and more efficient is very important. But I think we also need energy. We need a consistent energy source to help with the schools, and it helps with the jobs, and it helps with it in the, as a town overall. You want me to go next? OK. Sure. OK. Yes, ma'am. It's fine if you, if you want to if you have say that, it's OK. I would, so I would say, right, the key to the climate crisis that we are facing, not only here in Lansing, not only here in New York, but worldwide, is SMART's innovation and collaboration, right? And while we see that happening in various levels of government, we can also do things here at home. And it's everything from being conscious of the types of foods that we eat and how we prepare them to the type of waste that we generate and how we dispose of it, the type of windows that we use, how many pieces of paper we use, I know our transportation department is very conscious of looking at the energy that we use in terms of designing bus routes, right? Mm -hmm. That is a wide variety of topics, and I didn't even hit on the other million of them that we should be looking at. The idea, however, is that this is an all hands on deck, all aspects solution for and affects everybody problem. Can we solve it here in Lansing? Unfortunately, I do not believe that we can do that. Can we make a difference for our immediate environment? Yes, we can. Can that have a ripple effect? I hope so. Do you want to go on or do you want to go? Sure. It doesn't matter. All right, well, why don't we just go down the line? Okay. Um, you know, so I'm going to agree with Susan. You know, as soon as Claire, as soon as you posed that question, you know, my immediate thoughts went to what do we do here locally that can have an impact in our community from, you know, a source of, you know, being environmentally conscious and more sustainable. And, you know, as a district, we are, you know, we are innovative in that area already. You know, we have composting. You know, the middle school has taken on a project at looking at getting rid of, you know, the plastic silverware and going back to reusable, you know, we, we're completely recycling. We have the PTSO brought the, the TerraCycle program so the kids can, you know, recycle hard to, re or hard to compost, you know, food packaging, right? And so part of it is, is taking these little local steps, but through those small pieces, we are educating our students on the importance of being environmentally conscious, right? So, you know, having a conversation with a kindergartner about what does it mean to save the earth versus with the seniors, those conversations are very different, right? But if we can look across our campus and find ways to use this as a teaching moment, um, but also to reduce money, improve the environment, then it's going to be a win-win. And so looking at, um, you know, this year in third grade as an example, right, they have reevaluated their school supply needs and they are looking at how they can utilize Google Classroom and some other teaching methodologies and um, curriculum adjustments to reduce their amount of paper. And so by doing that, not only are they being more environmentally friendly, but they're giving the students a teaching moment, but they're also saving families 
um, financially because now there is no f burden to go out and buy school supplies for the third grade. So the more that we can look at these small moments, um, these, these local opportunities, we're going to support, um, we're going to be much more environmentally conscious in all of our decision making. Um, with that said, obviously the district and the board has already been looking at ways to you know, bring renewables to the district. You know, and as we continue to grow and as capital projects come up, that is constantly um, a topic of conversation is how can we still meet our financial needs, support the earth, and try to use clean energy um, where possible. So, and I don't have a whole lot more to add because they've said a lot of it. Um, you know, I think it really comes down to trying to reduce our carbon footprint and each of us taking responsibility for it. Uh, I, I had a brief stint on the board three years ago and we were looking at solar panels for the school district. And I know I have solar panels on my house and I can tell you that it significantly has decreased my electric bill. Um, so we, f you know, we feel like in, in our own way, even though they're just on our house, that we're, we're adding a little bit. And, and I think each of the projects that everyone has talked about makes a little bit of a difference, and that's what we can do. One of the things, and Erin and was talking about things that aren't so popular, what I'm going to say is probably not as popular either. Um, but I will tell you, as a 34-year resident of Lansing, one of the things that really bothers me is the number of parents that drive their kids to school. And when we talk about decreasing the footprint, that's a big thing. We have these wonderful buses that we're paying for, and we're paying drivers, and we're training them. And, and, I, and I do want to say a little thing, bit about mental health, because I think our bus drivers are in a key piece of mental mm -hmm. health, because they see those kids when they get on the bus. They see them coming out. And I didn't want to lose that, even though this is about environment, that um, I applaud them every day for the job that they do, because they know what those kids look like before they get off the bus. And sometimes I'm sure the principals have conversations with those bus drivers saying, so so-and-so so got on the bus, and you know, they were not in great shape when they got on the bus. And I, you know, it, to me, it, it brings home how every single person in our community has to be aware of that and has to be a piece of all that. I, I really didn't want to lose it because I applaud those bus drivers. They have tough jobs. I think I, as a nurse working in the hospital, have tough job, but I don't think I could be a bus driver. Are we um, allowed to add to stuff or no, <laughs> just one time? So, <laughs> well, it was about buses. It yeah, was no, really about... No, 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 I just, I... Yeah, it's I, a, I, anyway, so getting back to the parents driving, I don't know how we address that issue, but we do have you know, we do have great bus routes and they're well designed and I sometimes don't understand when I see the incredible line of people bringing their kids to school and it, to me that would be one way to, if we could start tackling that um, to think about helping decrease that carbon footprint. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you for being um, so aware. I compost, I, you know, we do everything we can in our house and and always talk to all the kids that come over to our house. So making it a teaching moment, I think, is also very important. I, and I guess that's what I add. With, with the carbon footprint, I think technology is great, but each, each laptop we give out or each tablet, each whatever, each board takes lithium. And there's mm -hmm. lithium mines and lithium pollutes. And solar panels are made out of toxic metals. Mm -hmm. So it is important to go green, and, and, but you, we have to look at the big picture and not say solar's the answer. Wind's the answer, anti coal is the answer because coal and natural gas power those tablets. So the more we have, the more coal and natural gas we need. So that's the balance of, of the big picture of with the solar panels that we were looking at years ago. Um, ultimately, it just didn't seem feasible to have that big of an expense for a questionable 25 year contract. It looks good to go green, but then when you look at the smaller picture, it's not always cut and dry. And that's, that's what I think we should make. We should we should make steps forward to be as most efficient as we can, but don't force it because that a lot of times costs people that unexpected costs. Okay, we'll take one more question. <laughs> <laughs> Just one? Pick the best. Pick the best. Pick the best one. <laughs> <laughs> There's no part A, B, C, D, Z. Yeah. This is what I right. this is a That's a good all idea. Of the, yeah. All of the above. If A, then J, K, L. <laughs> right. 
Um, as far as technology in the schools goes, do you think there's a, a role of, for like online courses more like individual studies using a computer with developed by teachers, or is that just uh, something you can't do? I, I would love to start with answering that. Can I, can I start? Is that okay with sure. you guys? Um, and part of the reason that I wanted to start that is um, I taught online for 12 years. I actually took graduate courses to learn how to develop online curriculum from SUNY Oswego and um, taught personal health, which for many years I had Lansing students in my class over the summer. And um, I still am in contact with some of them because they felt it was a really good experience. Um, it allowed students to free up. We talked about jam-packed schedules. It allowed them to uh, take that as their health course, and so it gave them a little bit of room. I have, can tell you many incidences of the value of online teaching, and I think that um, it allowed students to take online courses, receive college credit, and at teaching at TC3, we had probably 15 or, we have probably 15 or 20 students a year who graduate from high school with their associate's degree because they've been able to take online courses in conjunction with their high school courses, sometimes over the summer, sometimes in a short course in January. Um, and it, it not only augments what's going on, because you can also use online components to augment a classroom situation where they can go home and do stuff at home. Then you have to make sure that they've got the technology to be able to do that at home. But I had a st I've had several students at George Junior who were incarcerated and who took my personal health course and they only had a very limited time that they had access to the computer and someone was watching them the entire time that they were on com the computer but they interacted. So it is feasible to do it even just with the resources in in the building, students don't have to have a computer at home to do an online course. And it's a great way to expand the offerings that we, we offer for students, as well as also give them a head up um, you know, before they even go to college. And I will say the one other thing I love about online courses is every student has a voice. And I know sometimes teaching in a traditional classroom, I would always have the back row. Sometimes I drive them crazy because I teach from the back row. And they all of a sudden realized I couldn't sleep back there. But in an online classroom, you have to participate. And everybody has a chance to participate. You throw out a question in a classroom, you always have a few students who are the first ones up. They always, you know, they're able to process things quickly. In an online classroom, it gave them, every student, a chance to take some time to formulate what they, what they thought and also interact with their peers. And they didn't have to think, oh gosh, I could have said that if I'd thought of that 30 seconds sooner. It, it allowed an even field, an equal field for all the students in the class. So I personally really think online uh, learning is a very valuable tool and it would be a wonderful asset for students to be able to have more access to that. TC3 has a great offering and lots of other institutions do, but th it's local and the tuition's not that high and uh, there's a lot of support for it. So anyway, I could say more, but I'll, I'll allow somebody else to talk. You balance my time up. <laughs> <laughs> you yield the balance of your time. So, so I'm going to take a little bit different approach to the question. So I'm going to look at it more as technology in school versus specifically online classes, because online classes, when you really talk about that, is really geared mostly towards high school students and being able to do that effectively. You know, technology is a fantastic learning tool when we implement it appropriately. Um, especially in the lower grades, gamification is a very well used tool when it comes to learning math facts, that repetitious learning. Um, kids who aren't so good on pencil and paper um, can respond much more favorably, favorable, I can't even talk, favorably, thank you, um, when learning is gamified. Um, but you have to strike that balance between um, traditional pencil and paper, gaming, using technology for encouraging brain breaks so that kids can, you know, get all of their, the, the wiggles out and just sort of get those endorphins 
engage because you only have a little bit amount of recess, right? So research proves the more active younger kids are, the better they perform, the better they learn, the better their focus and attention. So being able to utilize technology like that in the classroom is an asset. But at the same time, as we move on through the middle school and into the high school, you know, it moves from more of a gamification to using it as your major tool, right? So we have Google Classroom, you're doing your PowerPoints, all of those assignments are done through, <coughs> through Google. And part that we have to be cognizant of is that not all students are going to have access to that tool when they go home. Yes, we have done a great job of ensuring that we can have laptops and things that can get checked out and go home to do those assignments, but there may not be access to the internet at home. And so when it comes to, a, to assigning the work, having 11.59 p.m. deadlines can be a challenge. Not only is it a challenge because you don't have access to the computer, but it's a challenge because as a district, we're giving the students the okay to say, you know what, you can stay up until midnight to do this assignment versus getting some sleep, getting rested, ensuring that you get up in the morning and are able to have a good meal and come to school ready to learn. We have to really be careful about how technology can actually impact them negatively by making it so wide open. We've got to put some parameters around there to ensure that if we're doing online assignments, let them be due during class time so that all kids have a chance to get that assignment done on an even playing field because there's many of our students that cannot do that. But at the same time, and I, I turn to the panel because you guys are our resident experts, right? You go to school for six hours a day, you have some form of practice, you get home, it's nine o'clock, and you probably are sitting down to do three hours of homework, right? Because that assignment is now due at 11.59 p.m. versus knowing you know what, I don't have to have this ready until I get into seventh period. I can use my time management skills to structure this mm -hmm. so I can do this better during the day. And so we, as good as technology is, we just have to be thoughtful as to how we use it and, and looking at um, different ways to ensure that students are getting the benefit from technology and actually not being um, adversely uh, affected with, without any, you know, without good intentions. I would echo all of those sentiments. Um, I would also um, want to mention the fact, not mention, but emphasize the fact that our teachers are the experts. Our teachers understand learning styles, our teachers understand instruction, and our teachers understand mm -hmm. what needs to happen in the classroom and outside the classroom. As a board, and as a board member, I would not presume to micromanage that decision for our teachers. I would want to have at their ready, at the ready for them, the tools that they may need to use and to be able to implement. But I, <coughs> I, I would not want to be in between your teacher and you um, with regard to that. That said, <coughs> as a teacher, I will say, I have a great poem that I, I read to my students at the <coughs> beginning of the year, every year. It's called, Did I Miss Anything? And it talks about students being present. You can be present in an online class. You can be checked out. You can be present in a classroom, in a face-to-face -face meeting, and be checked out. What I would hope is that as we use technology and different learning styles, we're emphasizing that idea of being present. Because what happened here tonight, just like what happens in classrooms every day, didn't happen any time before. It's not going to happen again. Were we here? Were we in the moment? And I think that to be able to say yes to that is a learning opportunity that we should not be passing up. Here's where I'm a little bit different. Than, but that's why the board works, because we that have different perspectives mm -hmm. on things. You're right is that I think online is important. I think we need social stuff. We need to have the, the papers typed. We need to have our students grow as technology grows. But there's a huge shortage in trades jobs, huge shortage in trades jobs. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge shortage in volunteering and being part of the community. And as we give them more opportunity to hide behind the screen, or maybe not hide behind the screen, but work from behind the screen, 
the less they interact with people. I, I would like to see the schools, and not just Lansing, but schools in general, kind of work more towards how do we get kids interested in trades? And how do we get them in, and you can build that screen. You can, you can engineer that screen. And you can engineer and work on cars and build and do things with your hands. You interact with people, you interact with, with employers, and you, can, you learn the skills, the life skills of, of what you like, what's interested, and you're also learning a career. Or, or a career like, I don't want anything to do with that, but I tried it. And it's that interaction stuff that, that goes back to volunteering and, and, and helping out and just being part of the community. That's what I would like to see schools is go towards more of a hand, like to be aware that there's a shortage in trains in, in, in the, the, the uh, tactical jobs and, and work towards that more than how can we get more screen time for our kids. Okay. I just wanted to mention that, uh, I guess it's a question of what you comment. Just mention, like, you go back 20 years ago and you went You want to beat the candidates. Uh, beat the candidates. I would beat the candidates. It wasn't sandwiched between budget presentation and school board. Um, it was held in what used to be the 101 of the high school, which is in theory probably half the size of the auditorium. And it was fairly filled. Uh, it went for two and a half hours. Probably 15 different people asked questions. And I'm sort of curious, does anybody have any ideas of why that is so changed, where it seems like it's not all that important? I think one, it comes back one, to... One person out here is asking questions, and what has changed in the community? That, is it not interested, or that everything's going great, or any I, ideas on why I think it comes back so to the same thing, where there's, there's not the volunteers, there's not the people stepping up to do... Even the board, there should be 10 of us running for the board position. And, and there should be 20 people out in the audience asking questions. And I don't think, I think when things run smooth, people just think it's running smooth, it's out of, out of sight on mind. Right. The school seems don't happy. Don't have to worry about it. And I think people just aren't invested in their communities. And, and to the turnout tonight is amazing. This is huge. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. But I wish we had standing room only. I wish there were more people asking to put us on the spot and to ask and, and be involved. I love it when mm -hmm. you come. I love the question. I, mm -hmm. could, I could sit for two and a half hours. I think it'd be. <laughs> <laughs> I would have, have, have answer questions all my own because that's what, that's what the community should know. OK. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Please be sure to vote. The elections will be held May 21st from 7 AM to 9 PM at the Teacher Center here at the elementary school. If you come early enough, you might see me. I'll be there. Oh. <laughs> um, and please help yourself to refreshments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good job. Good job. Our future is bright. I don't think I'm right. <laughs> no.